Disruptors and Curious Minds. Welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. Every week Hello. we have the supreme privilege of talking with the builders, designers, the leaders on the uh, innovation side, trying to make the world a better place using technology, using it the right way. And we get to try and distill that and make it accessible to the masses. That's what we uh, try to do. We got a book club. We do some other things too. But uh, Mark, how are you this morning? I, I couldn't have put it better myself. Yeah, I'm great. I'm still reeling from yesterday's quantum book club and apparently time doesn't exist. So I'm still getting to grips with that, but excited about today's show. Amazing. Well, uh, we want to jump right in uh, because this is a this is a fantastic discussion related to how we can use uh, blockchain technology, cryptocurrency type technology to make the world a better place through humanitarian aid and, and, and some of those things. So we want to start with it with a quick prime remark, maybe give give our audience a, a couple of reminders where we're headed with this discussion. We'll hit a sponsor message and they'll bring our amazing guest in. Yeah, so today's guest is Messina Tilleman Perez. I first met her in Paris. I was moderating a panel at Paris Blockchain Week. It was about corporate social responsibility, but really it ended up being a conversation about blockchain for good. And Messina it represents Circle. And at one moment she spoke about, um, what was the exact phrasing? Corruption resistant aid pipelines using USDC, the, the Circle stablecoin as part of it. Yeah, corruption resistant humanitarian aid pipelines. And when she said that, I was like, we have to have her on thinking paper because that's the kind of conversation amongst all the meme coins and the VC ineptitude and the scandal and the scams and all of the negative press around crypto, just to have a conversation about it's some positive, good cultural defining tech. So, give it, give it, give, give our listeners a, a quick, quick reminder of what, you know, USDC, you know, stable coin kind of stuff is maybe a quick little hello on that. <laughs> it's a stable coin pegged to the dollar and essentially a digital dollar but i will let messina explain it better than i can yeah safe to say a way a way to bring the uh old stodgy dollar uh onto a new digital highway right maybe yeah. a little bit cross chain right. i believe that it's on all nearly all the blockchains now as well so it doesn't matter which chain you're using layer two layer one it can be i think it's, it might even be on solana so Wonderful. Well, well, we want to uh, always give a great shout out to our friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. These guys have been a wonderful supporter of Thinking on Paper uh, over the last year. And uh, they have a, a great platform, over 3,000 vetted solopreneurs, specialists in their field that they are really great at organizing into cross-functional teams, pointing them to your project, whether it's a week, a month, a year, two years. They're fantastic at it. Check them out, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Without further ado, we are going to jump into Let's a go. technology for good discussion. Let's welcome Marcina to the show. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to join the conversation today. Thanks for being here. Wonderful. You want to start with the carryover question, Mark? Yeah. So uh, new listeners, we kind of thread the shows together together ask our current guest to leave a question for the next guest and so on. Last week's guest was Tyler Adams, CEO of COS. And his question for you, Messina, was how do we lower the bar and improve accessibility to blockchain tools? What can Web3 communities do to, to make the tech more accessible and by being more accessible, more useful to humanity? I think it's a great question. I have now been in this industry for about eight years, which just feels like a bit too long, honestly, but um, something has kept me here. And I think when I first came into the industry, it was because of the promise of financial inclusion and actual equality that I hoped the industry would facilitate. And to be honest, I really don't think that we have made good on that promise over the last, you know, decade plus. Um, and when it comes to kind of lowering the barrier for entry and ensuring that people who need these benefits most are actually able to capture them, I think we really have to not embrace technology for technology's sake. Um, so in my role at Circle, I work with humanitarian organizations from all over the world. and. Um, part of 
my remit is helping to facilitate humanitarian aid delivery using our digital dollar. And just a very quick example, um, in one of the partnerships that we had recently with a UN agency, more than 60% of the beneficiaries lacked access to a smartphone. It was really important to understand that at the beginning and to specifically architect the solution for those users. And I feel like too often we kind of build these solutions that don't have much connection to the populations who are ultimately going to be using them. But it's really critical that we appreciate our expertise for what it is, but we rely on other individuals who are on the ground who have intimate understanding of the specific communities that we're trying to address. And we let them lead the creation of these different programs so that they actually respond to the needs of the individuals who we're trying to serve. Yeah, it's like in technology, there's always a last mile bit that people tend to forget about. You build this great technology that can do something, but you need you need internet internet connection or a smartphone to be able to access it, right? So you got to bridge these these um, uh, these communities that don't have access to that last mile kind of stuff. Uh, and it's really cool to hear that that you guys think about think about that in 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 these ways. And you know, let's let's be real. Like the financial inclusion thing. I know that's not the head of this episode, but there's a big piece of that where these large financial institutions. Um, have forgotten about certain communities and forgotten about uh, certain groups. Similarly, on the financial aid side, it's really difficult and challenging to get financial aid to certain parts of the world due to the risky nature of of those parts of the world. So, the one thing I started thinking about, I don't, I don't really think about this a lot, but sometimes the only way to get financial aid to a certain part of the world is literally to have like a pallet of cash on a helicopter and like dropping it off at a location. So. When you think about that, like if there's a pallet of cash landing across over the border in a risky situation, there's a likelihood of that cash not landing in the right right hand, right? So, so what what is what is your like? That's got to be one of the key approaches or the key things you guys are trying to solve for is making sure this aid gets to the right people. So, how do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, it is truly the perennial challenge when it comes to humanitarian aid delivery. Um, financial institutions have a lot of constraints placed on them by examiners when it comes to moving assets into high risk or sanctioned jurisdictions. And despite great efforts by governments around the world to create, for example, specific licenses that cover humanitarian aid delivery, for the most part, financial institutions are very reticent to engage in these types of transactions, which to your point, Jeremy, means in order to actually execute a cross-border payment, they are often placed in the position of putting cash on planes, and then they create these honeypots of corruption. There is no real way to confirm that assets have been delivered to the intended beneficiaries. And I mean, you really can't think of a worse way to deliver humanitarian aid delivery if you want something that's secure, traceable, and ultimately that there's any sort of accountability related to it. So that is something that blockchain responds to in a really meaningful way. And I think it's, it's interesting because as far as I'm concerned, Blockchain technology has certain use cases that make tremendous amounts of sense. And there are a lot of things where blockchain really is not the right solution. But for humanitarian aid delivery, I think it is the perfect use case for blockchain technology. You're able to create these flows of funds that are much more targeted, much more secure, much more efficient. And when you look at the savings that people are actually experiencing when they have a blockchain-based humanitarian aid delivery program. In some of the most austere environments in the world, we're hearing from partners that they're saving nearly 40% on these aid flows. I think those kinds of savings are meaningful in any environment, but when you think about what unlocking 40% could mean when you're delivering humanitarian aid, 
you really kind of have to pay attention. And it's not just the cost savings. They've said that settlement times have reduced from, you know, more than two weeks to about a day. Again, that can be life changing in these crisis situations. So I think there's tremendous opportunity here. And we've been very encouraged by the openness of truly the largest humanitarian organizations in the world to do something new if it means making a better solution for the individuals that they're trying to serve. Could you speak specifically about a couple of examples where Circle has made an impact? Could you name countries, name regions or name organizations you've worked with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, as folks will appreciate, a lot of this work is Um, a little bit sensitive, and especially when you're operating in very high-risk jurisdictions, um, we can't share all of the details, but I'll walk through a couple of examples that I think illustrate the utility of these tools really well. Um, To start, during COVID, Circle was approached um, about an effort to support healthcare workers in Venezuela. These individuals were on the front lines of fighting Um, the pandemic, but they lacked equipment and they lacked medical resources necessary to do so. The program was ultimately supported. It was a public-private partnership in collaboration with the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, which was the government that the United States recognized as the acting government in Venezuela. At that time, it was led by Juan Guaido and the U.S. Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFEC, as well as um, a private enterprise called AirTM. So it was a number of actors coming together in order to get these funds that had been sanctioned by the U.S. um, from Maduro's government in Venezuela and were then unlocked for the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela's government to send directly to these healthcare workers. So um, this started in 2020, and uh, initially there were more than 60,000 healthcare workers who were onboarded onto RTM's platform. They were sent USDC, and the program has now continued for four years. So it's been an incredible lifeline to these healthcare workers who continue to operate in very challenging circumstances, and at very least are now given the relief to get some essential medicine and equipment in order to do um, what they're doing. I think perhaps most importantly, this illustrates how USDC can enable the corruption, uh, the corruption resistant aid pipelines that you were talking about earlier, Mark. Um, it's, it's a way to move resources in a highly transparent, highly traceable and secure manner into these really complicated parts of the world where, for example, um, the Bolivarian government of, uh, or the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, any of the supporters of that party have had their bank accounts frozen in Venezuela. So that really does complicate um, the movement of funds otherwise. And I think importantly for this program and through RTM, while individuals receive the digital funds on their wallets, on their mobile phones, um, they can cash out in local currency at any number of locations. And RTM has this extensive merchant network. They boast anyone being able to cash out in under 20 minutes at a very low convenient location um, and their fees are almost universally under three percent which is what the un has put as a goal in terms of global remittance fees so um that has been a really cool example of seeing this in action um another one that i'll just uh speak to very briefly is in ukraine so after the russian invasion into ukraine Circle partnered with the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, to support internally displaced persons. And um, we have sent USDC disbursements to individuals' mobile wallets. They, again, are able to receive those assets in a discreet way, 
24 seven. And if they so choose, they can cash out in local currency at any number of money grams locations across Ukraine. They have about 4,500. And for this program, MoneyGram has waived all of the transaction fees. So um, there's the conversion rate, of course, going from USDC into the um, local currency, but there are no additional fees on top of that. So individuals are receiving all of the aid that was originally sent to them, but it's a much more convenient way of receiving it. And overall really increases optionality for the recipients. They don't need to go to a particular physical location at a particular time of day. Um, there's just a, a lot of flexibility that's unlocked. And I think particularly for individuals um, who are dealing with just tremendous uh, challenges, having this not be a complicated part of their everyday lives is, is really meaningful. It's, it's brilliant. And so, so when you're speaking, I'm, I'm wondering, so we have a good friend of the show called Corrales, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up his comment. And essentially, and I wouldn't my own thoughts here, is Circle is your, our stable coins. Is crypto better suited to some disasters or humanitarian needs than others? So for example, if you have a giant earthquake and every, everyone needs immediate care, money's perhaps not their initial need or people in Gaza right now, maybe money isn't exactly what they need, but they need the infrastructural help. They need food, they need water. How, yeah, do, does, does Stablecoin, does Circle help in certain situations better than others? Does it scale better in certain situations? And how how, how can it help in when it's like immediate helps needed on the ground? It's a very good question, and it's one of the reasons that we really rely on our partnerships with humanitarian actors to lead on the construction of these different programs and solutions. Circle is very good at um, creating USDC and, and supporting these types of projects, but we don't understand the intricacies on the ground in these different um situations. And so we we rely on our humanitarian partners. And what is um, certainly the case is it's an entire value chain that needs to come together in order for these programs to be effective. Um, Circle issues the, the um, currency, but we need a wallet, we need an off ramp, and all of those pieces need to come together. And it often does take a bit of time. And so as um, my boss, Dante Desparte, is fond of saying, you can't buy flood insurance when your house is already underwater. Um, for mm -hmm. some of these types of scenarios, if you don't have the infrastructure in place, it is difficult to argue that using USDC is going to be the most efficient or effective option. But as we create these partnerships and establish this infrastructure, I think increasingly, it can be a tremendously valuable tool in crisis situations and something that we have been um, hearing a lot from various humanitarian partners is that even with populations, for example, um, who maybe didn't have smartphones uh, that they had purchased themselves, humanitarian organizations are increasingly considering purchasing smartphones um, so that they have this connectivity with these individuals if, heaven forbid, they would need to leave a specific jurisdiction, they could continue to send humanitarian disbursements using digital dollars if they make that investment on the front end by distributing smartphones to those types of populations. So. Um, I hope I hope that answers the question, but uh, I do think it is always really critical to let the experts lead um, and not to pretend as a tech company or a financial services company that we know more than we do about some of these um, very complicated uh, situations. Yeah, and, and listeners, this is this is super important that that you know what what Versina and what these ecosystems are doing requires such a massive amount of coordination and a massive uh a, a, a rapid response time in the coordination of these activities and you mentioned some of the ecosystems the value chain uh in that 
what have you learned over your time doing this in coordinating these these massive efforts just from a strategy perspective working with the ngos working with your team working with the local community working with the you know the 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 on the ground people that maybe help train people on how to use a smartphone and a wallet like what what are some key takeaways that that, that you've pulled out of this um it's a great question and i think for me one of the big takeaways is regardless of the enthusiasm or interest that you might find within an institution it is really critical to um engage with leadership these are very vulnerable populations and understandably there's a lot of anxiety about embracing something new and so it's it's been very critical to engage um, with leadership with all of these different partners to make sure that there is the appropriate kind of um, buy-in and support uh, the other piece that i think occasionally gets lost in web3 discussions is how critical um, communication ends up being uh, and for a lot of these different programs there are just incredible teams with boots on the ground educating and onboarding users and beneficiaries and that's invaluable none of this would work if that educational piece wasn't present and wasn't supported in a very human way um, and it's one of the reasons why I really like this idea of kind of human centered tech, uh, that we're not just building tech for tech's sake, we are actually placing the ultimate users at the center of whatever programs we're um, building. Couple, couple quick thoughts on that. Nice quick little plug to, you mentioned human centered. We actually have Don Norman, who uh, is one of the premier uh, thought leaders in human centered design uh, July 1st. Humanity centered design. Humanity centered design uh, on July 1st. But one other thing too, Marcina, that that kind of, uh, kind of hit me pretty well was like the adoption of new technology in stable, calm environments is hard enough, right? So you have like this new technology that you know will make everything easier, but it's like a, it's a very uh, unstable environment. Like, how do you, how do you manage that adoption path with with with, that? with, with what you call Jeremy calcified kind of infra infrastructure around it? So it's a very unstable environment with a very too stable kind of infrastructure behind it. It's a great question, and um, I think when you're dealing with something as fundamental as money it's an incredible motivator to get folks to do something new. And I think we really saw that and have seen that in Venezuela. Um, as soon as this program was announced in Venezuela, the government actually blocked the app that we were using for it, RTM. And so individuals um, needed to figure out not just how to get the app, but how to use a VPN to get the app. And um, it was, onerous but ultimately there was a kind of rainbow at the end of of the storm right and they knew what they were trying to do was um to uh, to get this uh payment at the end and and i think that's really powerful it's a huge motivator and, and that's something that we have certainly seen um when existing systems really function it's it's easy to become complacent but when what you're dealing with is really not working um maybe you have a bit more appetite to do something difficult and to try something new yeah incentives are important uh in that in that aspect of it too really interesting um i know we want to be well yeah. a lot of these places they have the ultimate incentive which is staying alive and i think that building things which I, I just it's going to sound very simple what i'm saying but like makes that easier and makes that simpler and makes that available at scale is it's an addition and people it's always a zero-sum game with everybody but it's not it's this is an addition to make these things flow a little bit better a little bit quicker a little bit simpler a bit more cheaply I've got I've got one more question on my side, and we want to make sure we have time for Mercina to leave a question for our next guest. But what I, I noticed that um, that Circle has like these um, what is it um, unlocking impact competitions, right? So you have 
this these groups of entrepreneurs that are that are buying into you know what circle is doing they have great ideas that uh want to do good in the world what are what are a couple of a couple of these companies that you've seen or these ideas that you've seen scale into small companies maybe larger companies that that you're excited about that the world needs to know about yeah i mean um that is definitely one of uh my favorite projects that i run under the impact umbrella it's just an incredible opportunity to see um, you know, the courage and the resilience of these entrepreneurs doing really new challenging things in difficult parts of the world using circles technology and so we have hosted um, three of these thus far we'll have two more this year so um, if you're interested if you're an entrepreneur uh, sign up because we have one during the UN General Assembly and then another um during the world bank fall meetings in dc and some of the projects that i have been really excited by um that we've heard about are uh in again the humanitarian space there's one um the builder is based in nepal and she um focuses on distributing humanitarian aid to these very very austere environments using usdc but she also collaborates with local governments to understand how they can pre-plan for certain types of, um, for example, environmental disasters or crises and how they can kind of anticipate payments um, so that individuals can prepare for disasters and um, create resilience. Uh, so it's not as much disaster response and crisis response, but resilience building ahead of these different um, situations. So that's one that was very, very exciting. And then we had one um, recently in DC uh, where we, uh, the winner was ultimately an insurance company that's using parametric insurance. Um, and they're just, it's just a really thoughtful solution. They have kind of tied the insurance to the actual packets um, for farmers. So it's uh, insurance for the agricultural industry. Um, and if, for example, a certain weather event it occurs, they're able to unlock resources um, in USDC for the farmers who purchased the seeds in the first place. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. Again, it's, it's quite niche um, and we'd love to see these solutions built by the communities who ultimately are hopefully going to benefit from them. Personally, listening to you speak, you seem genuinely excited about these projects. So it's good to good to see, good to hear. Amazing. Well, 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 as we as we wrap the show again, be mindful of time and, and really appreciate your time and energy and, and learning more about what you're doing. I think this is such an important aspect of or application of this technology. We'd love to have you uh, leave a question for our next guest. We've got a couple of scientists, one, a, maybe a biochemist and maybe a quantum quantum. quantum physicist. So it should be an interesting discussion. But any question is on the table. It could be about anything. Uh, we just love to have a little continuity. So uh, what would you leave for our next guest as a question? Um, well, I would love to understand their perspectives on kind of the intersection of all of these different emerging technologies and how they will work together. Ultimately, I think um, I have become increasingly aware, mindful, and, and humbled by what a small piece, uh, for example, Circles technology plays in all of the different programs that we support. And I'm always curious about what can ultimately be unlocked when we marry these different types of technologies and these different kinds of expertise. And so um, would love to get their view on kind of uh, what's, what's next in terms of bringing these emerging technologies together to solve some of these really intractable or seemingly intractable problems. Great question. Wonderful. I love I love the intersections and adjacencies. It's where all the cool stuff happens. That's, that's so, what we do. That's right. Mark, uh, tell us about the book club and what's coming up next and we'll get everybody out of here. Yeah, the book club, you can check out thinkingonpaper.xyz. At the moment, we're reading The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli, um, Quantum Physics Explained or not making sense of what doesn't make sense. And on the 1st of July, we're speaking with Don Norman, author of Meaningful, Sustainable, Humanity-Centered Design for a Better World, which is going to be incredible. So get your questions in for that. And yeah, we'll see you on the 1st of July. 
Yeah, wonderful. And we'll get a big write up on all the great work that Mercina and Circle is doing at this sure. at this humanitarian intersection of technology. And we uh, want to thank Ripple again, W R I P P L E, Marketing's on demand talent platform. You need uh, to flex out to some experts that are not within your team. These guys are great. They're vetted. Uh, P.S. Mark and I are of the 3,000 solopreneurs in that ecosystem if you choose. Uh, but they're great. They can stack a team. They can point it in any direction you need. W-R-I-P-P-L-E dot com. That's it for us this week. Stay curious. Be disruptive. Keep thinking on paper.